Well, I want to begin this morning with a confession. I've got a confession to make. Not that kind of a confession. It's okay. I think I've already been quite vulnerable with you in the past, haven't I? I've told you that I'm an Alan Jones fan, so you know that I'm honest with you all. You know, that I'm, I'm, I'm not afraid to be vulnerable uh, and, uh, and to confess before you. No, um, my confession this morning, um, I don't find it easy to praise the Lord. It's not something that's instinctive. It's not something that's natural to me. So there you are. You've got a duff pastor. Sorry about that. You have to look to the elders, maybe. You could blame them. Maybe it's because I'm a leaky bucket. We've just been singing, haven't we? Praise the Lord, O my soul. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. And I don't know about you, but I find I'm just like a leaky bucket. I've got loads of reasons to praise, but they just slip through my fingers like sand. Or maybe it's because we live life at such a pace these days that where's the time for praise, really? Or maybe it's because sometimes life as a Duff Church leader just doesn't always leave me overflowing with reasons for praise. But you know, that's something of a problem, isn't it? When we come to bits of the Bible like this, Psalm 8. A song of praise. I mean, just think about how it begins. It's sheer praise, isn't it? O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And my immediate answer, nine days out of ten, is it just doesn't feel like that. Nine days out of ten, it doesn't feel like my Lord is majestic over my square yard of the globe. So I want us to, at the beginning of the time this morning, just stop and pause, all of us, each of us individually. How about you, this morning? How full of praise are you? How full of praise to the Lord are you this morning? And can I ask you, can you put your finger on what, what are the particular matters in your life at the moment which make praise difficult? It may be something very obvious, because some of us come with really difficult problems, don't we? Deep, deep problems, heartfelt problems. But what is, it, what is it in your life that makes praise difficult? Is it something that's outside of you? Something that's affecting you from outside of yourself. Or perhaps it's a sense of something that's going on inside of yourself. Is it a sense of hopelessness inside? Is it a sense perhaps of the weight of sin? Perhaps even from this past week. That sort of makes you feel, I just can't praise. have a think for a moment what is what is that thing at the moment that stops you from praising well let me encourage you first off psalm 8 is not how david always felt how it begins here and what i want you to do with me so i can demonstrate that is just to flip back in your bible at the first line of psalm 7 the one that came before this for example how's david feeling in psalm 7 Save and deliver me from all who pursue me, he says. Or how about Psalm 6, the Psalm of David. O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, or discipline me in your wrath. Or how about the beginning of Psalm 5. Listen to my cry for help, my King and my God. Consider my sighing, he says. Or Psalm 4. Give me relief from my distress. And even Psalm 3. O oh Lord, how many are my foes? He begins Psalm 3. Yeah? Now, now, now turn back to Psalm 8 and see the force in which Psalm 8 comes to us in the light of those. O oh Lord, our Lord, he says, how majestic is your name in all the earth. 
I think it's important that we see that because when David says life is rubbish nine days out of ten and it is just a hard slog and it is David is saying here's some things that I know that you should know some things that I've experienced for myself some things that you need to remember some things that the people of the one true God can praise God for every day And he's not kidding. He's not kidding. It's an everyday song of praise when we don't feel much like praising. I wonder if that's you this morning. Well, we're going to pull out from the psalm four reasons to be full of praise. And let me just advance this and we'll see. First of all, first of all, David says, Praise the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation it says that in verse 1 let me read that verse again O Lord our Lord how majestic is your name in all the earth you set your glory above the heavens how do you keep going as a Christian how do you keep turning up for the things that go on here and helping out Wednesday club is an example maybe or something else how do you keep putting yourself forward to to help uh, perhaps leading a Sunday service how as a Christian do you keep waging that war against sin each, each day or how do you keep sticking at that tough marriage or that tough relationship How do you keep holding out Jesus to people that just don't want to know? By remembering that there is a throne. By remembering that there's a throne room above the heavens. And in that throne room is a throne. And seated on the throne is the Lord. And to say that he is ruling and reigning, as David does here, is to know that everything and every event... All of it is utterly and absolutely, completely under his control, under his authority, under his jurisdiction, under his rule. There is one Lord, the Lord of the Bible. And in him the whole cosmos lives and moves and has its being. Nothing in this world slips out from under his grip. There are no accidents... There's no luck. Nothing is insignificant. He is the Lord. The earth is his footstool. His glory is above the heavens. And his name is majestic in all the earth. He's on the throne. And we need to know that each day, don't we? I mean, excuse me, but hallelujah. This Lord is on the throne. We've been here for about five months now and um, I can't get a window cleaner to come and clean our our windows where we live. Um, Apparently the window cleaners of Speak have got together and they've carved up Speak into little areas, uh, into different patches. So they've all got their own patch and of course they won't cross over from one patch into the next. You You just don't do that, you can't do that. So, so I tried to get a fella to come and, and, and clean our windows. We said, oh no, I can't do that. It's not my patch. You know, that would take me into another patch. Listen to me this morning. All of speak is God's patch. All of it. All of your life is God's patch. All of it. And if you're a Christian, you can call this Lord, Lord. And I think that's reason for praise, don't you? I think that's reason for praise. Praise the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation, David says. Secondly, praise him that his kingdom is not for spiritual heavyweights. Verse 2. A king this strong, as in verse 1, a king that majestic, well, you'd expect his kingdom, to be a kingdom for the strong, wouldn't you? A kingdom for the successful. 
for the pretty, for the handsome, all the things that the world values. And the trouble is, if I'm honest, I'm not those things. And when I tell people about Jesus, in their eyes, I know I'm weak, and I know it looks pathetic, actually. Come on, be honest. Doesn't it sometimes look and feel pathetic? You know, church meetings sometimes feel like that, don't we, if we're honest? And David finds, he looks around for the best example of weakness that he can find in his day. And he settles upon children and infants. Look at verse 2. He says, from the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. Something's caused David to notice this irony here. That God chooses for his people the little ones. The despised ones. His kingdom is not for spiritual heavyweights. And in fact, Jesus quotes these verses as he enters Jerusalem. And in the the Gospel of Matthew, the children, Matthew records the children crying out, Hosanna to the son of David as Jesus enters into Jerusalem. And the chief priests and the scribes, enemies, they're saying shut up to the children and the infants. And we just get this so wrong, don't we? We think we're going to advance God's kingdom through impressive looking programs. Or we're going to persuade people into the kingdom of God with the cleverness of our arguments, our giftedness. And when we don't feel up to that, it it makes us feel low. It doesn't make us feel like praising, does it? I'm so glad that God uses the weak and the feeble of the world to accomplish his purposes. Aren't you? That's a reason for praise. If you look out for an example of real strength, where can you go for an example of real strength in this world? Let me suggest something to you. Something really strong. Something really, really weighty. Something that is strong enough to silence the world. I think it's this. It's when a Christian whose life has been crushed through something that they've something that they've experienced perhaps it's been a bereavement perhaps it's a loss something in their life which has utterly crushed them perhaps you know know that yourself here this morning or a loss of some sort and yet that person says because they're a Christian they say I wouldn't have it any other way I wouldn't have it any other way That person is able to say, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's strength. That's real strength right there. That's strength to silence the world. I used to dread it when someone would, um, when I was learning how to run, I was starting out running, and someone would say to me, "Um, will you you come out with me? I, I, I go running. Will you come out with me? And I used to think, oh no. I used to hate that kind of question because I knew I wasn't really fit enough to keep up with everybody else. And I, I, I could just imagine that they were going to be really strong and I was going to feel really weak and um, not be able to keep up with them. Well, when the Lord says, run with me, he's not looking for impressives. His strength is made perfect in weakness. And so David says, praise him. That his kingdom is not for spiritual heavyweights. It's for weakies. I'm so glad about that, aren't you? Praise him for that. Thirdly, David says in the psalm, third thing he says is, praise the Lord for what he's made mankind. And this is the the, the largest part of the psalm. And I don't know about you, but when we reach verses 3 and 4, we think the subject is going to be, The praise of God because of his creation. 
Like the first song we sang, didn't we? Indescribable. You put the stars in the sky and you know them by name. And God's creation is a wonderful thing, isn't it? We can praise him for the, the creation that we can enjoy. But when we look at these verses more closely, we actually see it's about people. We could paraphrase verses 3 and 4. We could rewrite them something like this. David is saying, when I look at your majesty, when I look at the moon and the stars, he doesn't stop there. He says, when I look at those things, what really makes me scratch my head is, why should you give a monkeys about people? Small, insignificant human beings. When you created on that sort of scale, how can they matter to you? And David, in those verses, is actually saying to us, go back to Genesis. Go back to the book of Genesis, the the beginning. Go back to Genesis chapter 1. I don't know how often you read the beginning, the books of Genesis. Um, I've got four kids now, and if you've had a lot of children, you'll know that that tends to be something you sort of read it on loop, really. Because the children's Bibles all, uh, all have the story of Genesis. And um, uh, so we we, we find ourselves constantly going back to uh, the story of creation, and um, and when we do it so many times, we kind of it kind of washes over us. God made this, and God made that, and God made this, and God made that, and then God made man, and now let's carry on. And it washes over us and brushes over us, and we don't actually stop and think. And David says to us, stop and think for a minute about what. God is saying at the beginning in that book of creation, Genesis chapter 1. We saw something, somebody on the video that, 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 uh, that uh, Steve was showing us. Genesis chapter 1 says that God made human beings glorious. <coughs> a little lower than the angels, verse 5. And if we were to, to, to have time this morning and to go back to Genesis chapter 1, we would see that God crowned humans that he made with glory and honour by creating them in the image of God. After he'd, after he'd created everything else, he said, let us make man in our image. Giving them authority to rule under God over his creation. Verses 6 to 8. How valuable are you and everyone you'll ever meet? To God, the answer is of infinite value. Of infinite value. God makes human beings glorious, whoever they are. Even Zacchaeus. Of infinite value. You and me and everyone you'll meet. The woman at the news agents. The kids that you pass on the street. (coughs) The driver who's just blocked your exit out of the side lane. The children on the playground that swear at you when you go past. (coughs) Your wife, your husband, your neighbour. The person that you're sat next to right now. The person that you'll sit next to on the bus tomorrow. If you travel on the bus. All of them, according to Genesis 1, are glorious. Made in the image of God. Of inestimable value. They occupy God's mind. Because God made them and he loves them. I don't know about you, but that's medicine for my cold heart. Because that is not how I see people. I need reminding of this truth every day. This kind of truth, the way God sees people, frees me to love people as I should. This medicine for my cold heart. It lifts me out of the world of being hated and hating back. And it helps me to move towards people. I may not be able to explain to people why God allows suffering. But I can say to someone who's suffering, do you know what? You are of infinite value to the God that created you. You are of infinite worth to him. That's a fantastic thing for us to be able to say, isn't it? 
And so we should be able to praise the Lord for what he's made mankind. What he's made every man and woman and boy and girl. He's made them weighty. He's made every person significant, loved, of inestimable value. And we forget it, don't we? And finally, praise him for the certainty of his plans for mankind in Christ Jesus. So we've just seen, David's just said, go back to Genesis and see how special people are, how glorious, how deserving of dignity and honour. But we ought to be feeling very sad, really. Because let's face it, this picture of mankind ruling over creation, crowned with glory and honour, the paradise of Genesis chapter 1 and 2, isn't what we see, is it? That's not how it is now. We see loved ones reject his love. A world that turns its back on this God. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so we want to ask the question, who can restore that paradise? Who can reverse the curse? Who could be crowned with glory and honour? Verse 5. When in the words of the song that we were looking at last week, Psalm 62, all men are a breath. And death and judgment comes to us all. And so when we look at the world around us, we say, well, is this Psalm 8, is it, just a, is it just a pipe dream? Is this really what mankind is like? Does God give weight and value to every person on the one hand and then snatch it back with the other? That doesn't sound... That, that, that's hopeless, isn't it, if that were the case? No, we don't see Psalm 8 working here in this, on this earth at the moment. We don't see that. We don't see everything under mankind's feet right now. But we do see Jesus. We do see Jesus. The risen and reigning Lamb upon the throne. Jesus who exchanged the glory of heaven for a life of poverty and rejection. Gave himself at the cross and he put, he put sin and death under his feet. And he didn't stay dead. He is the Lord. The name above all names. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. It's about him. But it's also about us because God has promised that you can reign with him. You can reign with him beyond death in the new heavens and the new earth if he will be your Lord and Saviour he will not be ashamed to call you his brother Hebrews chapter 2 provides proof that Psalm 8 isn't just a pipe dream and it's where we're going to finish this morning Hebrews chapter 2 makes these things in Psalm 8 certain and worthy of great praise to him. So please keep your finger in Psalm 8 at the moment. And turn forward in your Bibles in the New Testament to Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 5. Probably best to start right at the back of your Bible. And just flick a few pages forward and you'll find Hebrews. Because it's almost the last of the books. Page 848. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 5. This is how the writer to the Hebrews interprets what's going on in Psalm 8 and shows us that it's about Jesus and it's about the hope that we have in him. Look at Hebrews chapter 2 verse 5. It's not to angels that he subjected the world to come about which we are speaking but there is a place where someone has testified and that place is Psalm 8. There is a place where someone has testified. What is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honour. Putting everything under his feet. In putting everything under him, God left nothing that is not subject to him. Yet at present we do not see everything subject to him. 
But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honour because he suffered death. So that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. And by his suffering, he brings many sons to glory. Verse 10. He is not ashamed to call them brothers. Verse 11. There it is. Praise him for the certainty of his plans for mankind in Christ Jesus. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. We are born one with Adam. But as the video said, will we be one with Jesus? Because that's where the hope lies. He is the Lord. He is the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. But is he your Lord? It's a question we have to ask when we come to the end of the psalm. And if Jesus is not your Lord this morning, then let me help you with that in this coming week, or even after the service. Do you see how he values you like nobody else, like nothing else in this world? You are of infinite value to him. Don't be his enemy this morning. That would be stupid. That would be the stupidest thing to be. For the God that loves you, for whom you are of inestimable value. And believer... Can I just ask you, at the beginning of the service we said, what's that thing that prevents you from praising this morning, praising him? Can you just call that to mind again? What was it that stops you? Can you hold up whatever that thing was to the truths of this psalm, Psalm 8 here now? How, how does it look in the light of what we've just seen in Psalm 8? How does that thing look when you, when you realise that the Lord is the king of creation. He's, he's ruling over that thing which might be troubling you at the moment. He, he is over it all. That his kingdom isn't for spiritual heavyweights. You can be weak. A part of his kingdom. Praise him for what he's made mankind. Praise him for the certainty of his plans in Christ Jesus. To you, his goodness to you in the light of that. Can you, can you do that this morning? Can you praise the Lord, the Almighty, the King? Can you praise Him in your weakness this morning? Can you praise Him this morning for Genesis 1? Mankind made in the image of God, you and everybody you know. Can you praise Him for Hebrews chapter 2 this morning? That image restored in Christ and promised to you this morning. And let me make a suggestion. Mark Psalm 8 in your Bible. A psalm of praise for the days when you don't feel much like praising. Of course, those truths will help you. Nine days out of ten. Nine days out of ten.